All right, so uh, this is going to be a, a lecture on basic MR physics. So the idea here is to set some groundwork um, for the next few lectures when we really get into the uh, MR of pulse sequences and how we do cardiac imaging. So the goals for this particular lecture is we want to go over the basic principles of signal generation with MRI. We want to talk about what is T1 and T2 and how that affects image contrast and know the difference between spin echo imaging and gradient echo pulse sequences. And uh, most of it will be spent, you know, understanding the basics of how MR data is converted to image data. So when we're doing MRI, we're looking at hydrogen nuclei and we are using radiation, uh, we are using electromagnetic radiation, um, but we're using radiation in the radio frequency range, not in the ionizing range that we use for x-rays. So the radiation that we use, the electromagnetic radiation, doesn't cause any damage. So when you're looking at what's different about the size of the wavelength and the frequency. When we do x-rays, we use very short wavelengths of very high frequency, so they're very energetic, and that causes ionizing radiation and tissue damage. When we're doing MRI, we're using uh, wavelengths that are much larger, and the, uh, what we have here then are wavelengths on the size of buildings, very large wavelengths, and these are in the range of wavelengths that they use for just regular radio. So that's why we call these uh, radio frequency pulses when we talk about uh, the excitation pulses that we use in MRI. So we apply these radio frequency pulses to excite the nuclei, the, the hydrogen nuclei that we wind up imaging. And most of that is contained in, in water within the tissues. So when we give these radio frequency pulses to these nuclei, these hydrogen nuclei, it excites the nuclei, and then the, the nuclei, as they relax, they give off the energy, and they give off that energy in terms of what we measure as a signal. Actually, that signal is a small electrical current, but we'll talk about that in a minute. The signal strength, the amplitude of the signal, depends on the particular pulse sequence and the local environment of the hydrogen nuclei. So we can adjust our pulse sequences to what particular tissue we want to see. So we can adjust our pulse sequences to make the, uh, to make the fat bright, to make the amplitude bright where there are regions of fat on the image. Uh, the problem here when it comes to imaging is that the signal that we receive, which is what we call the echo, is that signal that we get back after we excite the nuclei, is this echo comes from the entire imaging slice. So we have to be able to take that signal that we receive and deconstruct it to particular locations in three-dimensional space into voxels or pixels so that we can convert then the signal to an actual image. So what we're going to go over and what the textbooks talk about is the classical model uh, with all the spinning protons and the precession and all of that stuff. Just realize that that is really a model that, that is not really the way it works. I mean, these protons don't really precess in real life. And Actually, the, the real explanations are quantum mechanical explanations that basically where you put in energy and then the energy comes back uh, from the protons as these signals. But these models are useful for getting a conceptual understanding of, of what is happening. And so it, it helps us basically to better understand what's going on. And the, the actual explanation is a little bit too complicated for us to deal with. Um, so starting with that classical explanation, the hydrogen atoms that we deal with, or the hydrogen nuclei, um, they have a dipole moment, meaning that they're like little bar magnets. They'll have a north pole and a south pole. And when we place these in a magnetic field, the, this magnetic moment here can either align with the field or against the field. So it can align going up like this, or it can align going down. It turns out that they align in both directions, and there's only a few parts per million more that align with the field as opposed to those that align against the field. 
So when we talk about what we're doing with MR imaging, whatever happens to those that are aligned with the field, the exact opposite happens to those that are aligned against the field. So the signals that we get and, and the images that we see are just because of those few parts per million more of these hydrogen nuclei that are aligned with the field as opposed to those against the field. So the question comes up, why is a three Tesla magnet better than a 1.5 Tesla magnet? Well, a three Tesla magnet gives you more signal to noise. And the reason for that is uh, that that higher strength of the magnetic field means that a slightly higher proportion then of these uh, hydrogen nuclei will align with the field. And so there's, there's more than that's available for the signal. So the three Tesla magnet then gives you more signal to noise than a 1.5 Tesla magnet. So something else happens when you put the hydrogen nuclei within the magnetic field in addition to lining up. Uh, we'll deal with those, the, those that line up with the field is that these, they start to precess, meaning that you, you, they undergo this, this kind of motion here around uh, the main vector of the, of the magnetic field itself. Um, now, this is important because this, this precession frequency, and at 1.5 Tesla, that precession frequency is 64 megahertz, which again is in the radio frequency range. And this becomes the resonant frequency. And what that means is, is that these nuclei will only absorb the radio frequency pulses or respond to radio frequency pulses at the resonance frequency, at the frequency at which they are precessing. So this precession frequency and the resonant frequency then is determined by the magnetic field strength that is experienced by the hydrogen nucleus. So by changing gradients within the main magnetic field and changing the magnetic field strength that the particular hydrogen nuclei experiences, we can change then its precession frequency and then we can also then um, adjust our radio frequency pulses so that they are at the correct frequency to excite those particular nuclei. So this gradient manipulation then is what we use for spatial localization. So by manipulating the gradient in certain parts of the patient and in certain parts of your image, um, then we can direct the radio frequency pulses to that particular part of the anatomy and then only deal with the, the signals that, that come from there. So we have trillions and trillions of these hydrogen nuclei that are aligned with the field and are precessing them around the main magnetic field. Uh, so instead of dealing with them as all as individual protons, we can add up their longitudinal magnetization and then just deal with that as one longitudinal magnetization vector that we have here. And then we will say that this is the direction of the main magnetic field. When we give a radio frequency pulse, we usually deal with, or we'll start dealing with these 90 degree radio frequency pulses. And what this will do then is this will cause this, this precession that it's doing to get wider and wider until you can imagine it taking this longitudinal magnetization vector and basically flipping it 90 degrees. So now we take that main longitudinal, uh, we take this, this, this main component of longitudinal magnetization and after the 90 degree pulse, we flip it 90 degrees, but it's still precessing. And so now we can think of that vector as precessing here within the plane. And it's that precession then of this vector that of this uh, magnetization then then actually gives us a signal. It's, it's that component in the transverse plane that actually gives us a signal and generates a signal within our receiver coil. And that signal will resemble a sine wave. So that signal will also decay. And we'll talk about what we mean by rotational frame of reference in a second. So what happens is after, after we take that longitudinal magnetization and flip it 90 degrees, it is still precessing now in this horizontal plane. The receiver coil is, is really a coil of wires. And remember that this is, uh, this is uh, 
magnetization here. So this has a magnetic field to it. And this magnetic field then, as this is rotating around, will go through the coil and will change the flux through the coil itself. And that change in flux as the magnetic field, that transverse component going through the coil changes, that generates a current within the coil. So the signals that we get from um, the transverse component of this longitudinal magnetization as it's precessing around, that will increase and decrease, causing an electrical current through the coil. And that current is what we measure or what we call the signal. Um, now, we also talk about a rotational frame of reference uh, because remember that this is precessing around and, and rather than try to think of all of this circular motion going on, we can pretend that we are in the rotational frame of reference, meaning that we are also precessing around, our point of view is also precessing around, along with this transverse magnetization. And then we can just, we would just see this as one stationary vector. And so it's easier to think of it that way, to treat it that way, and that's what this rotational frame of reference is. Now, the signal will decay, but before we get to that, we have to talk about what happens after we flipped it 90 degrees. After we flipped it 90 degrees over time, this longitudinal magnetization that we started with will come back. As it relaxes, this longitudinal magnetization will come back until it was where it was at the very beginning before we gave the 90 degree pulse. So that recovery of longitudinal relaxation, how quickly this recovers, is related to this uh, T1 time constant that we talk about, the, the T1. So what T1 represents is, that's the time constant for longitudinal magnetization to recover to 63% of its initial value. So after we flipped it 90 degrees, in some period of time as this recovered, once it gets to 63%, that we consider that the T1 of the tissue. And it turns out that fat has a short T1, water has a long T1, meaning that if you were to do this experiment, that longitudinal magnetization would recover much faster for fat than it would recover for, for water. So the T1 for fat is shorter than the T1 for water. All right, so let's get back now to the transverse magnetization. Once we flipped it 90 degrees, this transverse component is still precessing, and it's producing a signal within our receiver coil. And initially, if we just measure that signal, it will look like this. It looks like a sine wave, and it will decay because that transverse component of signal will also decay. So talk about why. Why does it decay? Well, the, the signal comes from, again, these trillions and trillions of protons, and they're not exactly in the same environment. So once we flip them 90 degrees, the, the magnetic field strength that each of these protons um, experiences within each voxel is, or even within the voxel, is slightly different uh, because of the tissue it's in and what is surrounding the proton. So that affects then the magnetic field strength, the local magnetic field strength that that proton experiences and also changes its precession frequency to the point that these protons start, start to precess at slightly different frequencies. So they start to get out of phase. And it's this dephasing then that causes the transverse component to decay. So it's that loss Dephasing is loss of phase coherence. It's that loss of phase coherence that causes the decay in our signal. Now, that dephasing is due to two effects. There's an intrinsic T2 effect, which has to do with the actual tissue itself or the actual environment that the proton is, uh, is experiencing, and that is not reversible. And that's what eventually what, what we will want to be looking at because it reflects differences in tissues. And then there's an extrinsic uh, effect from the magnetic field itself. The magnetic field itself is not absolutely perfect. There are these magnetic field inhomogeneities that will also cause the field strength at particular locations, even though we would like them to be exactly the same, to be slightly different, affecting then the precession frequency of the, of the protons. 
And so this can be a major component to the dephasing of the protons and that loss of signal. Fortunately, this is reversible, and we'll talk about how, how we do that. So the intrinsic T2 effect, the part that's not reversible, the term we use for that is spin-spin relaxation. That is not reversible. And there is a time constant for that, and we call that the T2 time constant. And that's the time constant for transverse relaxation or the dephasing. And the definition of that is that time constant is the time to decrease to 37% of the initial value. So once we flipped it 90 degrees, we start to get a signal. That signal decays, assuming we're uh, only measuring, uh, you know, assuming we've gotten rid of the extrinsic effects. We're just looking at the intrinsic T2. Once that gets to the time it takes for that to get to 37% of, of its initial value, that is the T2 then of the tissue. And it turns out that water, of course, has a very long T2. And then when you look at for any particular tissue that you're examining, the T2 is always shorter than the T1 time. Now, this extrinsic effect uh, on, the, uh, on the loss of signal, uh, we refer to that as the, mostly it's uh, static magnetic field and homogeneities, differences in the local strength of the magnetic field um, in small regions of space, that is reversible. And so we would like to try to get rid of that to get at what is happening with the intrinsic T2 of the tissues. The combination of the intrinsic and extrinsic effects, we call that T2 star. So that decay in the signal, when it's due to intrinsic and extrinsic effects, then that's a T2 star time constant for that. So initially, when you flip it 90 degrees and the signal decays, you're looking at a T2 star decay curve, and there is a time constant for this, and that time constant is called T2 star. So that's the combination of the intrinsic and extrinsic effects. Again, we would like to evaluate the intrinsic T2 effect because this has more to do with the actual tissue that we're looking at rather than the strength of the magnetic field external to the tissue. But to do that, we need to reverse the extrinsic effects. We need to get rid of these magnetic field inhomogeneities. And before we get to that, we have to talk about a few more definitions. What is TR? What is TE? TR is the repetition time, and it's the time between radio frequency excitation pulses. So we will give an excitation pulse here, and then here's the next excitation pulse, and here's the next excitation pulse. So the, the distance then from one excitation pulse to the next, one radio frequency pulse to the next radio frequency pulse, usually these are 90 degree pulses if we're doing spin echo sequences, that is the TR, the repetition time. TE is the echo time. So that is the time from the center of the radio frequency pulse to the center of the echo. So we give a radio frequency pulse, we get a signal. The next TR, we give another radio frequency pulse, we get a signal. So the time interval between the radio frequency pulse and the center of the signal or the center of the echo, that is TE. And both of these are measured in milliseconds, so TR and TE are both measured in milliseconds. Now, getting back to getting rid of that extrinsic T2 effect. So the way to do it is with what's called a 180-degree refoc refocusing pulse. And what happens here is, remember we said, once we give the 90-degree pulse, these spins start to get out of phase with each other, and most of that is due to the magnetic field and homogeneities. If we give a 180 degree pulse and then just flip these over this axis, in the beginning, these were precessing a little bit faster than these, so these spins got ahead of these spins. Once we flip them 180 degrees, now the spins that were precessing faster have fallen behind, and they will eventually catch up. And when they catch up, everything will be in phase again. So we would like to give then this 180 degree pulse 
halfway between when we've given the initial 90 degree pulse and when we want to measure the signal. So we give the 180 degree pulse halfway in between. Whatever dephasing occurred from the extrinsic effects of the magnetic field and homogeneities, those get reversed and then the phases come, uh, the spins come into phase again, and then that's what gives us a signal. So that's called a spin echo pulse sequence. So a spin echo pulse sequence is a pulse sequence that uses a 180 degree refocusing pulse. Now here's a nice little animation that kind of explains visually what's going on here. So we start out with our spins uh, oriented here, 90 degree pulse. Now they dephase, give the 180 degree pulse, things flip around. And the, the spins that were too fast catch up with the spins that were too slow. And then everything is in phase again. And once they're in phase again, that's when we get our, that's when we get our echo. That's when we get our signal. So whenever we use a 180 degree pulse, then we are using spin echo. The term spin echo in the Jing is when we use a 180 degree refocusing pulse. So initially we would give a 90 degree pulse and the signal would decay very rapidly because of the magnetic field and homogeneities, but once we give that 180 degree pulse, it reverses the magnetic field and homogeneities and the spins come into phase again, and that's when we get our signal. That's when we get our spin echo here at TE. And then I've given you this also, the differences between T2 and T1. It's not that you need to memorize this, but the, 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 point, the point is is that T2s are usually short, much shorter than T1 times. So that dephasing occurs very rapidly. All right, so let's see how well you were paying attention. So concerning a spin echo pulse sequence in MR, which of the following is true? Oh, we have two answers so far. How are we doing here? Give me a few more seconds. Not too hard. Four, three. And how did we do? The 180 degree pulse should come at time TE over two. Remember we said that you want the 180 degree pulse to come halfway between the 90 degree pulse and whenever you're going to be sampling the echo. So it has to come at one half of T, all right? So that's when you want your 180 degree pulse. Okay. So let's talk about now, how do we use this to get tissue contrast? How do we use T1 and T2 to get tissue contrast? Again, remember our basic definitions, TR repetition time, the time between your radio frequency excitation pulses, TE is the echo time, the time between the RF pulse and when we get our signal, when we measure our signal, and then all of that is measured in milliseconds. So let's assume we want to do a T1-weighted scan. We want to do T1-weighted imaging. Easy to remember, T1, short TR, short TE. The short TR, the short repetition time, will accentuate the T1 effect, and the short TE will minimize the T2 effect. So, so what does this mean? So let's start with, we have fat and we have water. And let's assume that this longitudinal magnetization for both of these is about the same. So if we've given them both a 90 degree excitation pulse, initially the signals from them would be the same. But remember that we said that the longitudinal magnetization for fat, fat has a short T1, so that recovers faster than the longitudinal magnetization for water. So when I get to my next 90 degree RF pulse, assuming that this time is short, the fat will have recovered a significant amount of its longitudinal magnetization. The water will be lagging behind. It has not recovered all of its longitudinal magnetization. And here I give another 90 degree pulse, and this time, because all of this longitudinal magnetization here is available to be flipped into the transverse plane, I get a lot of signal from fat, but the water does not have as much. I get very little signal from water. Now, I want my TE 
to be short because again, this signal is going to be decaying very rapidly. So by, ke by keeping the TE short, I measure that signal right away. So for T1 weighted imaging, short TR, short TE, what happens is these tissues with a short T1 like fat will be bright on your T1 weighted images. Now for T2 weighted images, again, easy to remember, long TR, long TE. So a long TR minimizes the T1 effect and a long TE accentuates the T2 effect. So what happens here? So again, we'll imagine we have soft tissue and water. Now water has a very long T2 compared to soft tissue. Now, by keeping the TR long between radio frequency pulses, what that means is I allow this longitudinal magnetization to recover between radio frequency pulses. So I have a lot of longitudinal magnetization here. Now I flip it 90 degrees, and initially I would get a lot of signal comparing the soft tissue and the water, but if I wait enough time, what happens is that the signal from the soft tissue dephases rapidly. The signal from the water takes a longer time to deface. So when I get out here at TE, when I, if I've waited a nice long TE time, a long TE, now because the water takes longer to deface, I have more signal from the water than I have from the soft tissue. And then by the time I get to my next 90 degree pulse, all of this longitudinal magnetization has recovered. So we just do the same thing again. So T2 weighted imaging then, tissues that have a long T2, these are the tissues that would be bright. So on T2 weighted images, you can see that the CSF then is very bright, and then the soft tissues would be much darker. That's how you do T2 weighted imaging. All right, so what happens with MR imaging if TR is long, but TE is short? What does that do? No guesses? Just one, one person brave enough to take a crack at it. A few more. All right, so we'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. It looks like we're kind of uh, all over the place on this one. So. So the, the, the correct answer is that this will actually degrade the tissue contrast. So why does that happen? So we'll talk about this. So, so long TR, short TE is called proton density uh, imaging. And so what happens here is that you maximize the contribution, the signal from both T1 and T2 effects. So this type of sequence will give you a lot of signal. So what happens is what if we wait a long TR time, all of the longitudinal magnetization has recovered regardless of what the T1 is of the particular tissue. So you have a lot of longitudinal magnetization available here. And then you give your 90 degree pulse, and then all of this is flipped in the transverse plane. But if your TE is very short, there isn't a lot of time for dephasing. So again, you're minimizing the T2 effects. So both of these tissues, whether it's soft tissue or water, whether it has a long T2 or a short T2, will give you a lot of signal. And so then what that means is that you're not really doing T1 weighted imaging, you're not taking advantage of T1 effects, you're not taking advantage of T2 effects. So you lose image contrast, but there is a lot of signal in your image. So your image then becomes nice and bright, but you, you don't have as much contrast in the image between various tissues as you would in T1 weighted images or T2 weighted. So um, actually getting back to, so why don't we do short TR, long TE imaging? Well, we don't do that because then there would be no signal, right? So if you had, if you had a very short, uh, if, if you had very short TRs, there wouldn't be much longitudinal magnetization available to flip into the transverse plane. And if you had a long TE, whatever you did flip into the transverse plane would decay over, the, over time. So your signal to noise there would not be very good. You'd have not very good signals. So that's why we don't use long TR. Uh, we don't use short TR, long TE imaging. All right. 
So on exams, often they will just show you the sequence and you have to be able to identify what kind of pulse sequence it is. So this is your basic spin echo pulse sequence. So a basic spin echo pulse sequence has a 90 degree excitation pulse and a 180 degree refocusing pulse. And then you get your signal here, you get your echo and the refocusing pulse then comes halfway between the TE time and the 90 degree excitation pulse, okay? Now, you can also do imaging where you flip in less than 90 degrees. So this is gradient echo sequences, and that's usually depicted using this alpha. So if instead of flipping 90 degrees, we flip this less than 90 degrees, remember it's the transverse component of this vector that produces the signal within the receiver coil. So even if you use just a 30 degree flip angle, not very much, that still provides 50% of the total signal available because of the projection here along the transverse plane. So the advantage of this is that it allows for very rapid imaging, very short TR times, uh, because you have, so, you have so much of this longitudinal magnetization that, is, that can still recover between these very short TR times. So if you want to do very rapid imaging, we will use gradient echo pulse sequences where the flip angles will be small. And that's to make sure that we do, because we have very short TRs, is to make sure that we do have longitudinal magnetization left over uh, between one, uh, one TR and the next TR so that we will generate signal. We will generate a new signal. And then for your basic gradient echo pulse sequence, you don't have a 180 degree pulse. So you'll have your radio frequency excitation pulse, and then you will have your signal. And then uh, the way the signal is generated is, you know, for, for those of you that are more advanced using the, the read gradients here, so along the frequency encoding gradient to generate the gradient echo, there's a dephasing lobe, and then there's a rephasing lobe, and then we will see the echo right in the middle of the rephasing lobe. So that's how they determine where the TE is going to be for a gradient echo pulse sequence. Okay, so using then um, the, if you're using these gradient echo pulse sequences, uh, uh, remember we said that you're, you're not reversing um, the static magnetic field inhomogeneities. So these become then very dependent on T2 star effects, okay? because it's the spin echo, that 180 degree refocusing pulse that is really important for getting rid of the magnetic field and homogeneity. So these gradient echo pulse sequences then will be very sensitive to T2 star effects, intrinsic and extrinsic components of what alters the magnetic field. So now how do we convert all of this to actual images? So when we place the patient in our, in our MR magnet, um, we have a main magnetic coils here within the magnet, which will produce the main magnetic field along the z-axis. So the main magnetic field is along the bore of the magnet. And that is usually de designated as B0, the main magnetic field. Now, within the magnet, you also have gradient coils. And these extra coils, then, uh, we will use to affect the gradients to, to change the strength of this main magnetic field geometrically along the three directions. So we can change it in the X, Y, or Z plane um, using then these, uh, these gradient coils. And it's the, the noise comes when you're doing an MR pulse sequence, the, the noise comes from the banging of those gradient coils. So that's why MR is very noisy. You're listening to these gradient coils bang as, uh, as we're changing the, uh, the gradients along each of these coils. And then you have receiver coils that can be actually on top of the patient or it can be within the main magnet itself, which will then receive the, the signal. And then the, for, for cardiac imaging, we use what's called a multi-channel transmit receive coil. So we put, we put this coil right on top of the patient, right over the anterior chest. And don't you wish your, your MR scanner had a view like that, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Anyway, so that's the type of coil that we use when we're doing cardiac imaging. All right, so the first, first question is if we're, if, we're trying to, if we're trying to localize the signal, 
how do we pick a particular slice? If, if we want to localize for a particular slice, how do we just excite the protons within that slice? We do that with what's called a slice selection gradient. So we apply a gradient like this along the bore of the magnet so that the protons here at the head are precessing at a higher frequency than the protons here at the feet. And so remember that we said that the precession frequency determines uh, what frequency of radio frequency, what frequency of the radio frequency pulse of the RF pulse these protons will respond to. So we can adjust the slice thickness and the slice location by changing the bandwidth, and the term bandwidth just means range of frequencies of the excitation pulse. So the in this imaging slice here at this particular location, the protons themselves will be precessing at frequencies between here and here. And then if we, we can use then a radio frequency pulse of this width of frequencies of this bandwidth, and then that will only excite the protons within this imaging slice. So one way of adjusting the slice thickness is by changing the range of frequencies of the excitation pulse. As we make that range larger, then we will make the slice thickness thicker. As we make that range, we make the bandwidth more narrow, then we will make the slice thinner. Now there's another way you can also change the slice thickness. So another way that we can also change the slice thickness um, is by actually altering the, the gradient here itself. It's a little bit harder to do, but you could then, if you make this gradient steeper, uh, you, would, you would make the slice thinner. And if you made this gradient less steep using the same bandwidth, you would make the slice thicker. But usually we adjust slice thickness by adjusting the bandwidth, okay? Now the problem is that the MR signal that we get, the echo that we get, comes simultaneously from all of the protons in the imaging slice. So we're able to excite all of the protons within this imaging slice, and we're able to get a signal, but that signal has come from all of the protons within the imaging slice. We need to be able to deconstruct the signal into individual voxels, spatially, into individual pixels or voxels. And again, that signal is called the echo. So how are these related? So how does this, how does this explain what we're doing with MRI? So let, let's talk about that. So these are violinists within an orchestra that are all playing the violin. So if we imagine that all these violinists are playing the violin at the same time, and we've set up a nice little matrix here that kind of corresponds to our imaging slice, what, what we're trying to do, since we're trying to depict uh, this picture as areas that are brighter, areas that are darker, areas of higher signal, areas of lower signal, what we're trying to do with the violin is that we're trying to determine the amplitude of each pixel, which is the brightness of the image. So what that means here, if all the violinists are playing at the same time, what we're trying to determine is how loud is each violinist playing? How can we do that? And these numbers that I put in here, you can think of this as how loud each violinist is playing or the amplitude of each violinist. So remember that all of them are playing at the same time. And what we want to figure out is what's the amplitude of each individual violinist. How can we do that if they're all, if we get that signal, if we get everything at the same time? Well, we do this with Fourier transformation. And the idea with Fourier transformation is it converts a complex signal. So whatever complex signal that you have here, it can convert that into a sum of sine waves that vary by frequency and amplitude. So using the mathematics of Fourier transformation, you take this very complex signal and then you can break it down into various frequencies and amplitudes of simpler signals. That's Fourier transformation. But to be able to do that, we have to be able to spatially encode the signal if they're all playing at the same time. So one way we can do that is you'll hear this term of frequency encoding. So that's usually along the x-axis. So what does that mean if we're using our analogy of the violinist? Well, if we ask each violinist to play a different note, 
So the violinist in this column will be playing one note, the violinist in this column will be playing a slightly higher note of a slightly higher frequency, and the violinist, violinist here will be playing an even higher frequency. So this column might play the note C, this column the note D, this column the note E, but the point is they're playing different frequencies. So we're, we're giving them some spatial encoding in terms of frequency along that axis, and that's called frequency encoding. Now, who was the best human at Fourier trans transformation in history? It might surprise you that the answer was Mozart, because Mozart was able to listen to an entire orchestra, listen to an entire piece, and then he would be able to go and write down what each instrument was playing, the notes that each instrument was playing. So what he was doing then was taking this whole complex signal and Fourier transforming it into the individual notes. So that's what we're trying to do with the MR image. Now, we've said that we can encode, spatially encode along the x-axis using frequency encoding. We also need a way of spatially encoding this transverse the, 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 this transverse image in the y along the y-axis, and for that we'll use phase encoding. So we'll talk about what that means. So if we apply our frequency encoding, and I've given you the amplitudes that each violinist is playing, and each one is playing a different note, I can't take this complex signal and I can break it down into the individual frequencies. So I can break this down into, into the note C, I can break this down into the note D, I can break this down into the note E, and the total amplitude here for the note C would be 3.5, and you can add up what the amplitudes would be in each of these columns. So with frequency encoding and applying Fourier transformation there, I am able to break down the signal here into uh, its frequency components, uh, and so I'm breaking it down into these columns, but I still have the problem of resolving the individual rows. And so we can do that with phase encoding. Now, this is something you can do with MR. This is not something that you can actually do with humans. But what if the violinists were able to play in phase and out of phase? Obviously, humans can't do that. But if they were, then we could apply phase encoding here. So if we have them play at the same time and apply and play in phase, in this column, the amplitude of this violinist is 0.5, and the amplitude here is 1.0. So if they play in phase, this is the signal that we get. So the amplitude of this signal is just a summation, 1.5. If, however, I were able also to make them play exactly 180 degree out of phase, then these signals would start to cancel each other. So if these two violinists were actually 180 degrees out of phase, then the amplitude of the total signal would be 0.5, just the differences between the two. Now I have two equations and two variables. So a plus b equals 1.5, a minus b equals 0.5. Using this, I can then calculate what the amplitude is for each of the individual violinists. So this then has enabled me to reconstruct the amplitude of the violinist then along the y-axis using phase encoding. So notice that I had two pixels along the y-axis to resolve. I needed to use two phase encoding steps to be able to do it. So the number of phase encoding steps equals the number of voxels along your phase axis. And each phase encoding step requires sampling from one echo. So as we've said, the MR signal comes from all of the voxels in the imaging slice at the same time, and each echo that we receive contributes the information for the entire image, and that's why MR is very sensitive to patient motion. On CT, if you're scanning a patient from head to toe, if the patient moves while the scan is going through the feet, the images of the head are still okay. But MR does not, does not work that way. Because each phase encoding step that we use contributes information to the entire image, if an MR sequence takes you 10 minutes and the patient only moves during the last two seconds of the sequence, that's enough to mess up the entire image. Because when the patient moved, the information that, acqui that was acquired at that step 
is used to reconstruct the entire image. Now, each phase encoding step requires sampling from a separate echo. So, and what we call each of these individual echoes, as we're sampling each of these individual echoes, we call that data space K space that they go into. So each echo then contributes one line to K space. So, as we've said, the phase encoding steps, the number equals the number of voxels along the phase encoding axis. We sample each echo. Each echo gives you one line of data. That one line of data goes into our data matrix, and that data matrix is, is called K-space. So one, one echo con contributes one line of K-space. And generally, the number of echoes sampled equal the number of voxels along the phase encoding axis. That determines the lines of the number of lines of K-space that you would need. So what is the advantage then of a rectangular field of view? So here you have a rectangular field of view. You can have a square field of view where your phase encoding voxels are the same as the number of voxels along your frequency encoding axis. But if you have anatomy like this, where the anatomy itself is actually rectangular, then it would be most advantageous to use the shorter distance here as your phase encoding axis. And the advantage of that is because you would have shorter imaging time, less lines of data. This is why MR takes so long. The reason MR takes so long is you have to acquire all of these echoes for every line, for, for, every, for every voxel along your phase encoding axis. So if your matrix is 512 by 512, you need 512 echoes, and that takes time. But if you have a rectangular anatomy like this, we put the shorter anatomy along the phase encoding axis, and then maybe we can do 512 along the X axis, and we can do less, 256 along the Y axis. Then we only need 256 echoes, so that shortens the imaging time. So that's where the time penalty comes from. It's obtaining all of that phase information. So K space is the raw data matrix. One line of data is one line of K space. The number of echoes sampled equals the number of voxels, usually along your phase encoding axis. And MR is slower at acquiring images than CT. So here, where we have no phase encoding, that's our first line of K-space here. And then as we apply the phase encoding gradient, we have to obtain separate echoes for each separate phase encoding gradient. And then we use these echoes to fill up this matrix of K-space. Now, you will see these pictures of K-space. And what do these pictures represent? Well, imagine taking the echo itself, taking the signal here, and what we're looking at is a pictorial description, uh, the depiction really of the magnitude, of the amplitude of the echo as you're going across. So notice that the echo here gets louder in the middle, the amplitude is increased in the middle. So as we take that first echo right through the center here with a zero phase encoding gradient, we go through here, notice that it is much brighter in the center because the amplitude is larger. So generally in the center of K-space, because that's the center of where we've sampled the echoes, uh, right in the center of your K-space picture is where the image will be brightest, and then towards the edges is where it gets darker and darker. So this is the actual raw data. You have to apply Fourier transformation to this that then converts this into your actual image. So this is K-space, which is the raw data. We apply Fourier transformation to that, and then we get our actual image, okay? So when we talk about the center versus the edges of K-space, in the center of K-space, the phase encoding gradient is much lower. So the very center, there's no phase encoding gradient. The phase encoding gradient is set to zero. As we go towards the edges, as we go higher and lower, we apply higher and higher phase encoding gradients. And these phase encoding gradients causes, cause the protons to lose phase. And because of that, the signal is less. So as you go towards the top and the bottom of, the, of your K-space image, then the signal is, is less in the periphery. So the phase encoding gradients at the edges of K-space have are higher at the edges and so the signal is less. So what we get then from the, from the mid portion of K-space, we have more signal, 
And as we go towards the edges of k-space, we have much less signal. From the middle of k-space, that contributes most to the image contrast. So image contrast is determined by the data here right in the middle of k-space. The edges of k-space contribute to the edge detail, contribute to spatial resolution. So the edges of k-space give you spatial resolution. The center of k-space gives you image contrast. So is there an intuitive way for us to understand why the center of k-space contributes to image contrast while the periphery of k-space contributes to edge detail? Uh, well, there's a wonderful explanation provided by uh, this book, uh, written by Vivian Lee. Uh, this book was written almost 20 years ago, but it's an excellent textbook discussing MR physics and cardiac MRI in general. Well, imagine that uh, we have a T1 weighted image here, we have fat, which is going to be very bright on T1 weighted imaging, and we have the kidney sitting here right in the middle. We have our frequency encoding gradient going this way, our phase encoding going this way, and on a T1 weighted image you expect the fat to be very bright as we have here uh, in the kidney uh, uh, less intense in signal. Well, it is easy to understand why in the center of k-space we get image contrast if we imagine that here in the center of k-space the phase encoding gradients are not very strong, so everything will be in phase. So where you have homogeneous regions of tissue, the protons are close to being in phase, so you will get a lot of signal here from fat. And then where you have the kidney, you will get uh, less signal. And so then that contributes to our image contrast. So that's pretty easy to understand. What's a little bit more difficult to understand is why in the periphery of K-space, uh, why does this contribute to edge detail or resolution? Well, what happens at the periphery of K-space is that the phase encoding gradients are stronger and stronger. And so these adjacent rows are going to be more and more out of phase. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the very extreme, these adjacent rows are actually going to be out of phase by 180 degrees, meaning that if I have a, a row of voxels here and a row of voxels here, even though they're coming from the fat, they're going to be out of phase with each other, so they're going to cancel out in signal. And the same thing is going to happen here in the kidney. These, where you have homogeneous regions of tissue, these adjacent rows are going to cancel each other out, and so you're going to get very little signal. And the interesting thing is what happens at the edge boundary? Well, at the edge boundary here, even though this row is going to be out of phase with this row, the signal from this row uh, is not going to be uh, enough to completely cancel out what's coming from this row. So what that does is it makes the edges at the boundaries visible. So when we go to our image here that comes from the edge of k-space, you see that here where you have homogeneous areas of tissue, you get very little signal, but right at the edge boundary where you have changes in the signal characteristics, that's where you can see the edges. So this is a very nice intuitive uh, understanding of why in the periphery of k-space that contributes to the edge detail and to the uh, resolution uh, on our image. Why is this important? Well, here's our picture of k-space, and here's a picture of the anatomy. If we just took the middle of k-space and reconstructed an image from that, it would look like this. You have lots of image contrast here, very nice image contrast, but you don't have much image detail in terms of resolution. If we got rid of the center and just used the periphery to generate our image, we lose a lot of image contrast here, although we still have lots of resolution, but you lose your image contrast. So the middle of k-space gives you lots of signal. That's what gives you the image contrast. The edges of k-space give you resolution, image detail. Now we can take advantage of this if we're doing MRI and geography. So if you're doing MRI and geography and it's gonna take you 20 seconds or longer to acquire your whole sequence, that contrast is going through the vessels and might wash out. So what you want to do is 
you want to catch the contrast in the vessels very early on when you have the most image contrast to get your best images. So what we will use then is what is called centric phase encoding for MRA and geography. So what that means is the first thing we get after we give the contrast are, is the data here right from the middle of K-space. So we get this data first to give us nice image contrast because the, the, the contrast agent is going in and we have all of that brightness from the contrast. So we will use that there. So we will acquire that first before the contrast washes out. And then after we've acquired the center of K-space, then we go on to acquire the periphery of K-space. And it's okay to acquire that when the contrast is washing out because it's the center of K-space that gives you your contrast in your image so you will see the vessels nice and bright. So this is called centric phase encoding, and that's what we use for MRA geography, okay? All right, so that is our basic lecture on MR physics, and now let us go on to the quiz.